Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. I am Jen and this is Fundy Fridays and here on my channel I talk about different aspects of Christian fundamentalism, American conservative politics, pop culture, gay stuff, and we talk a lot about the Duggars. After all they kind of inspired a, an entire movement and uh, they're the reason why I have this job. So before we begin I would like to remind you of a few things. Number one I have several abortion fundraisers going on right now. Hot Toddy and the Dunking Darling series. Series. We are working on stickers and pins. In the meantime, we have lots and lots of shirts and a couple of them are available in tie-dye, which is really cool. We also have a Patreon with one tier that is $3. You get exclusive videos and access to the Discord. And we now have YouTube memberships where you can um, join similar tiers. And the only difference is you get emojis and a cool color by your name when you're in the YouTube chat. But but it pretty much does the same thing because I know there were people that didn't want to mess with Patreon and you can do YouTube memberships now. Please, please check me out on my social media. My Instagram is a great place to keep up with my various escapades. Um, like I said, I've been in a few articles and I've been on a shitload of podcasts this month and the info box also has other ways to contact me, including my Goodreads because I know a lot of people are all constantly asking me for book recommendations that's there. Also in the info box, we have the content warnings. If I never warn you audibly, I will put that in the info box. So I'm pretty sure that's it. Um, let's begin. I've got a couple of Duggar updates for you, big and small. So, all right. First item of note in this update episode, Josh was recently caught with a contraband cell phone in prison. I do not personally believe in Solitary confinement, I believe that it is psychological torture. That being said, he needs to have some sort of consequence for smuggling in a cell phone and knowing just how much Josh loves to skirt the law and authority and thinks he can do whatever he wants. There is something satisfying about him finally facing a consequence. So that's my uh, nuanced take on the subject. Um, and the things that he did um, directly contribute to horrific child abuse. So I guess if anybody was going to have to be subjected to this, maybe it's him. I don't know. Don't cancel me. Hi. Okay. So we just have a couple questions to the jail that is holding Josh. The prison. In, well, Dumbass. in prison. Yes. Okay. One, how did he get a cell phone? Probably a guard. If not, there are ways to smuggle things in prison. It's quit acting dense. Yeah. Two. What was he looking at? Ooh. Probably Farmville, Facebook, and if I had to guess, some really dark parts of the internet. I don't even want to know that. Three. What did he do to get the cell phone? Mm -hmm. Probably has a lot of money on his books because his family is rich. Are you trying to make a joke or imply that he did some sort of favor to a guard or somebody higher up because that's not funny and um, what you're describing is assault. So I hope it was worth the five seconds of attention, Amy. And four, what was the fourth one? Who gave him the cell phone? Yes. That's the same fucking question as the first one. So, yeah, that's what's going on with that. Right now, he is um, currently in uh, the Federal Correctional Institute in Segoville, Texas. If you're from this area or you know how to pronounce that, go ahead and correct me because I do not know how to say that. He is in solitary right now, which also means he does not get visitors. So, damn, you just blew your the one time that you were probably going to get to see your kids for the next six months. Josh's legal team is trying to appeal his conviction right now. Um, and I will let James explain a little bit more of that because it is very confusing to me. It's like algebra or long division. My brain just shuts down. Hey y'all, so we're gonna talk today about how Josh's first appeal trial went, which took place on February 16th of this year. During the trial, Josh was represented by his fancy sex crime attorney, Justin Gelfand, and the prosecution was represented by attorney Joshua Handel. Josh's defense team laid forth three primary arguments for why they felt that the initial lower court ruling, which originally went against Josh and led to him being imprisoned, should be overturned. The first of these was the assertion that Joshua's cell 
cell phone was taken out of his hand during the initial search of the car lot that led to his arrest. However, this one's kind of odd because Gelfand and his team are asserting primarily that Josh was denied the right to contact his attorney when the cell phone was taken out of his hand. Although at the time, Josh was not under arrest. He didn't need to be read as Miranda rights. He was told several times, according to police and prosecutors, that he could leave at any time. He was totally free to go, presumably which would allow him to drive straight to his lawyer's office if he wanted to. Furthermore, the agents kind of had to take it out of his hand since the cell phone was included in all of the electronics that they were there to confiscate as part of the investigation. And presumably they would want to take it as soon as possible to make sure that Josh didn't tamper with it, delete anything, stuff like that. So taking it out of his hand makes a lot of sense. And the second assertion being made by Josh's legal defense team is that he wasn't allowed to call fellow sex offender and Carlot employee Caleb Williams to the stand and try to blame everything on him. And yes, by my reading, that's exactly what they're upset about. See, the prosecution has stated that the defense was allowed to call Caleb at any time, and they just had to do so in a timely manner, which they did not, and they had to keep their questions pertaining to whether or not Caleb could actually have committed the crimes in question, namely the downloads of the illegal CSAM materials that Josh was convicted of downloading, and, although not necessarily a crime itself, the partition to the hard drive, which would have indicated an interest in committing the crime. The prosecution has demonstrated that Caleb was out of the state of Arkansas at the time that the partition was made to the hard drive, which, which is a process that can't be done remotely and has to be done actually in the room with the computer. And also they were allowed to ask whether or not Caleb had, had remoted into the work computer while he was out of state, which by all accounts he did not. So since he did not route into the computer remotely, and he wasn't in the state to be able to partition the hard drive, it seems like Caleb Williams, despite being a creepy gross sex pest on his own, is just not the creepy gross sex pest we're looking for here. I don't know if maybe I was reading it wrong or, you know, not following the links correctly, but I can't find out how much money they raised. Um, but apparently our Duggar Snark, or the, the people of R. Duggar Snark purchased a bunch of stuff from the wish list and donated money to the um, Children's Safety Center of Washington County, which is where Josh is from. And this is a Reddit message from somebody who works there talking about how thankful they are that they got all these nice donations. And it just makes me so happy when something good comes out of our community. Yeah, I just thought that was a nice, bright uh, moment. Just a few days ago, Jessa released a vlog on her channel detailing the loss of her fifth baby. Following this news, she underwent a DNC, which is a procedure that is technically, in medical terms, an abortion. So while I do feel empathy for her situation and I do not wish this kind of tragedy or grief on anyone, nothing in this life exists in a vacuum without context. Both Jessa and her mother, Michelle, have made offensive anti-Semitic remarks comparing abortion to the Holocaust. So, in my opinion, it is understandable that when people found out that Jessa underwent the same procedure that is now outlawed in many states for many people in this country, they were rightfully a little pissed off. People are dead because of these types of laws that Jessa and her family fought so hard for. That's why this discussion needs to be had, and that's why I'm talking about it now. Here is a clip of her vlog, content warning for pregnancy loss. It is very hard to watch, but I figured I would let you see this. Ben was there, and he put his arms around me, and the technician went out and just said she was going to give us some space for a moment, and just trying to process through the loss. And we're just sitting there and holding hands and crying, and what do we do from here and I feel like in some ways missed miscarriages can be so much more jarring because you don't have clear signs of something going wrong. I mean I had minimal spotting for like 24 hours and that was it. In the end I ended up having to go see my doctor and because my history of hemorrhaging and all of that, there was concern that if I tried to just take something or pass the baby at home, that that I might have trouble and have to be transported and all of that. It just wasn't 
something that seemed like a very good option and so we decided to go to the hospital, get checked in there, and go through the process of a DNC. It was a difficult experience. Before getting checked in at the hospital, I just had a moment like by myself to just think about the weight of the situation and what had happened and start to process. It. Ellie B. Stuckey had something to say about this because she thinks she's the smartest person in the room, and Jessa retweeted that, and then Jessa made a statement, which I will not read to you. Women have DNCs for many reasons, not all of which include killing a living human being. So she's already saying, I'm different than you guys. Um, you killed your baby and mine is dead, so I'm really upset. That's how I read it. Um, she's saying, how dare you compare these two procedures because, yeah, she's being judgmental. And my baby's heart had stopped beating three weeks before I had a DNC. By the way, this was not my first DNC. It was my second. My first was two weeks postpartum Ivy's birth for a retained placenta. Okay. Each person is created in the image of God, Genesis 127. And to purposefully destroy a baby in the womb is an affront to the God who created that life. And tell that to the many religions that allow abortion. There's a world of difference between someone dying and someone being killed. To equate one to the other and to a mother grieving the loss of her baby, no less, is severely distasteful. There is a world of difference between a mortician and a murderer. Even a child understands the difference between the two. So obviously Jess is very hurt by these conversations and this discussion, and I do not think it's okay or moral to be contacting her or harassing her or leaving comments or doing the same thing to other members of her family. But on the other hand, she made this statement to to really say something right she really was putting down her foot and saying this is how i feel about the situation and um she's casting judgment on on people who have abortions and this she's saying they're murderers and it's not healthy it's not good um and it's hurting many people and i really really truly hope and pray you could say that um jessa never has to be denied a life-saving procedure because of the uh, ramifications of these laws that her religion and her uh, political party fight for. Hey y'all, um, editor's note here. Um, as I was literally editing this video, Ben just posted this statement about Jessa and Allie B defending her and like, yeah, look how serious she is. Um, and I just thought it was really funny because he says, I demand a public retraction and apology for your words, shares, retweets, or likes by which you've slandered my wife, further wounding a grieving woman. It reminds me of when Mr. Krabs tried to take back that guy's memories. Show's over, Keepskate! <laughs> anyway, so I think this is really fucking stupid. How dare you say we're attacking Jess's character when she literally called people who have abortions murderers. So what I really want to say about this whole situation um, is that it's important to note right out of the gate that the situation surrounding Jessa Duggar and the end of her recent pregnancy is one of layers and nuance. What we know is that she recently went a DNC, which stands for dilation and cutterage. And I'm not going to pretend to be a doctor, but suffice to say that this is a common obstetric procedure utilized to remove the tissue of a non-viable fetus and fully end a miscarried pregnancy. In the news coverage surrounding the story, one is likely to hear Jessa's situation referred to as a miscarriage, an abortion, or even just a medical procedure. And truly, all three are correct ways to identify and interpret the situation. If we want to be really technical about it, the medical term for a miscarriage is spontaneous abortion. And so, in an age where even basic medical terminology can be weaponized against us, it is not surprising that Jessa's recent situation has become a battleground of labels. Tragically, but expectedly, it seems like these labels are being applied very particularly along the well-established battle lines of the culture war that is reproductive justice in America. Words are important, and this is exactly why. Justice is also very important to this situation, particularly because of the road that Jessa has taken in order to get to this point in her life. A loud, proud, and consequential crusader for the anti-abortion cause for over two decades now, Jessa carries with her a baggage that I think very reasonably 
makes many focus on the multitude of privileges that stacked up around her as she pursues a kind of health care that she has vehemently opposed for everyone else. And make no mistake about it, this very important and fully benevolent procedure has absolutely been denied for folks other than Jessa. The DNC has been a victim of the most recent U.S. wave of state-level abortion bans being enacted by soulless Republican majorities, empowered by our current post-Roe reality. A plethora of people for whom this procedure could have saved countless hours of agony and despair have been denied their God-given right to proper medical care thanks to thoughtless and Machiavellian abortion bans, such as the six-week law that was recently passed in Texas, or like the abortion ban that happened in Missouri merely minutes after Roe was repealed. Check on your Missourian friends, we are not doing okay. It is well within the realm of possibility to think that if Jessa hadn't lived where she did, hadn't been who she was, that maybe she would have been one of those left to suffer. I truly hope that that never happens to her. So those who champion reproductive justice will rightfully refer to Jess's abortion because that is what she had. Underneath all of the PR and marketing language that, that currently clouds the conversation, any procedure that assists in the ending of a pregnancy is by definition an abortion. And states like Texas have shown us that even the most safest, most ethical, and most humane procedures are on the chopping block if they fall into that category. In regards to Jessa, I can respect her choice to label it as a miscarriage instead, while also supporting the correct use of language for reproductive health procedures in these contexts. We must demystify reproductive health care if we are to secure our rights to it, and this situation is just far too vulnerable a social talking point to pass up in such a time as this. Well, so while I support Jessa and I wish nothing but the best for her as a person, I am just as happy to admit that I find no sympathy for her should she find the label abortion to be offensive. She was the one who used her public platform to vilify those same procedures and those who received them with words normally used to describe the Holocaust. So until we have reproductive justice, this poetic justice will just have to do. To change the subject now to something a little less infuriating but also still very annoying is Ginger's book. So I did end up reading it um, and I talked about it at length with the Celebrity Memoir Book Club podcast on their Patreon. It is propaganda and it is not a tell-all. Um, it is very boring, but I did highlight a bunch of stuff that I felt you guys would find interesting because you're nerds for religion, I assume. Otherwise, why would you be here? Let's see. Number one. Um, I posted about this on Instagram, but there is a story in here where um, Ginger and her family were in New York for a TV appearance and they were... Um, and for some reason, Bill Clinton was there and he actually fell and uh, grabbed one of her sister's hair to stop his fall. What she had to say about that was, hey, that's New York City, baby. She also talks about free ginger. And there's something that I learned was that um, this really got to bothering her at the time. And I can see why, especially because she was worried about what her family thought about her. And somebody at her church actually had her make a ginger is free indeed t-shirt and wear it. So... It's kind of girl boss. It's kind of slay. Um, a lot of this is like she will take a Gothard principle and then show you a biblical principle, like the real way or the way, the right way, um, according to Jeremy. Um, and that's pretty much what this whole book is. She admits to a lot of things that sound like mental illness to me. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean that in a like she ruminates a lot. She has compulsions. She has high anxiety. I just really wish that she could get proper help. She talks a lot about Gothard being a celebrity. Oh, she says something like um, she was with her sisters at the mall and one of them put on a a uh, blonde wig and they were like "Ooh, I look like I'm ready to go to conference or whatever the culture around gothardism was so much so that he was a pervert that the girls were making jokes about it like it was such a part of the culture that it was like funny to them one of the stores we browsed we noticed a blonde wig it reminded us of a certain type of girl we all tried it on and for a few minutes joked about being ready for headquarters by headquarters, we were, of course, referring to Hinsdale, Illinois, where Bill Gothard led the IBLP ministry. Why was it funny to say that a blonde wig qualified us to work there? Because for years, people in our circles talked about how Bill Gothard liked to surround himself with pretty girls. We all talked about how they were nicknamed Gothard's girls. They ranged from teenagers to women in their mid-30s. Most of them had long blonde hair, big smiles, and petite body types. Many came from single-parent homes without a father or grandfather to guide and protect them, a.k.a. Bill Gothard swooping in trying to fill that role. 
When they joined IBLP and met Bill Gothard, they found someone who presented himself as the father they never had. At the time, the joke in the mall didn't seem like that big of a deal. Everyone knew about Gothard's girls. For us, this wasn't more than an odd quirk of our little world. Now, everything that's happened over the past 10 years, I realized the joke wasn't funny. It's disturbing that an older man insisted on surrounding himself with young girls, some of whom were still minors. And he did so in the name of a service to God. Those poor girls, they had no idea what they were getting into. Oh, she said that one year Recovering Grace rented a billboard in Nashville right, right next to the like ATI conference. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, she talks how she wears pants and she's okay with some birth control. And basically she's a Calvinist now. Um, and that's got its own controversial history. I don't really have an opinion on, on it because I am not a Christian. Um, but I will say that there has been controversy surrounding Jeremy's uh, seminary school. So John MacArthur leads this mega church and this, uh, he's the chancellor at the seminary school that Jeremy is studying at. Um, and his church basically told abused women that they need to stick it out and uh, stay with their abusive husbands. And this was such a huge uh, problem and culture that now there is a reckoning happening. Um, and I would like to do an episode on this man eventually. So don't worry. I just got a lot to do. Anyway, so this is according to Wikipedia because I like how they sum things up. In February of 2023, Christianity Today, which was founded by Billy Graham, published multiple instances of MacArthur's Grace Community Church advising women to stay with sexually and physically abusive husbands. This was sourced through interviews with ex-Grace Community Church elder Han Cho. Cho discovered that Grace Community Church advised women to stay in abusive relationships and worked to have the church apologize to past mistakes. Cho brought letters to the elders and MacArthur who ultimately told him he needed to walk back his findings if he wanted to remain an elder. So they covered it up. Cho resigned the next day. One of the victims, Eileen Gray in particular, was publicly shamed in front of the congregation for divorcing David Gray, who later was convicted of aggravated child assault, corporal injury to a child, and child abuse. MacArthur told her she needed to model for her children how to suffer for Jesus by enduring David's abuse. Cho was told by MacArthur to forget it when he called on the elders to do justice. And I thought I would just let you guys know that people are wising up. Also, he's John MacArthur is, he teaches homophobic and complementarian uh, beliefs, things that I don't support. There's been a lot of things. Um, just yesterday, Ginger went on Girl Defines channel and, um, we got to talk about that. Hey, sisterhood. I am so excited for this conversation today because if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that I have with me Ginger Duggar Volo and you may. So I just want to know because I always like talk shit and tell secrets um, on interviews and podcasts before we start recording. And I just want to know what they truly talked about. Okay. So I read your entire book before this because I was so intrigued for one. When Already a better interview with an Allie Beth. I saw it come out and I was just really like, I wanted to learn and grow as well because I grew up in a similar background. So in your book, Vision Forum. Thank you, Michelle. You talk about this Christian subculture. You talk obviously a lot about Bill Gothard, IBLP, um, the big ATI conferences. And I remember going to some of the same conferences as you, like mm -hmm. seeing your family there and seeing your parents speak. And it was interesting because although we went to some of the events and like did some of the programs, my parents were always a little bit hesitant about joining because they were like you know it just seems so focused around this one guy bill Can you imagine um you know we weren't into like wearing the skirts to the floor we played sports and we wore pants but we still my parents were like we still like some of these principles i'm from a big family not can you imagine the alternate universe where girl defined were as esteemed as the duggars like they were pretty big deals in vision forum which was kind of like the cousin of iblp um and uh, similar uh, leaders who assaulted people, similar um, draconian rules, similar uh, groupthink, all that kind of stuff. So I just think it's interesting that they aren't more friends. Um, but also, I feel like they'll be friends eventually, these two, Kristen and Ginger, because they have an exchange later on that's like actually really sweet. Um, and they look like they're having a good time. Nine kids feel small compared to your family. <laughs> but it's just so interesting. So much of what you were sharing in your book, I was like, oh my goodness wow, I had never thought of it that way. Or wow, you know, I'm, I'm not really in that scene anymore, but she's so right about so many of the principles and the things that were taught 
through these programs. And so I was just relating on a personal level. I was encouraged by the way you were digging into scripture um, and just the way that you were saying, look, we've got to look at God's word. We've got to look to him for our answers and not a program, not a principle and not one man. And as I was looking through some of the comments on your social media that someone had commented regarding your book, this one girl said, she's like, I've been watching the Duggars for years. I love their show, but what is she talking about? Like, cult like religion or breaking free like she was so confused like what is going on I wish I didn't and although know I feel like I can relate to a lot of what you've shared in your book I think some people listening right now might feel like what is she breaking free from what a cult like what is she talking about so can you just give us a quick nutshell on what that means yes so my story that I wanted to tell in this book becoming free indeed it's, it's really the story of my faith journey because I did grow up under um, some harmful theology that it threatened to leave me fearful and confused about who Jesus is. And so this is the story of how I've had to, what I'd say, disentangle truth from of course. error. When you mention a cult-like religion, what does that mean? Yeah, I think that these teachings, I, I can't say, okay, it is a cult because I think the experts would have to say that, okay, this guy may be a prophet from God. Maybe God sent him to share this, this, um, these teachings that I wouldn't have been able to figure out anywhere else. And so that in itself was enough to like, now looking back, I'm like, that was, that was crazy that I thought that. It's so sad to see how I think whenever kids are trying to leave that, that's a lot of kids who just genuinely in the beginning weren't saved we're wrapped up in that it does not these kids aren't saved the beauty of the gospel something to focus on mm -hmm. it it's focusing on your performance man-made religion all these rules as being um what will either gain you favor with god or will um bring harm on yourself yeah yeah have you been able to talk with any of your siblings or parents about the book specifically yes i have yeah so i talked with my parents before um I said anything publicly to anyone and we were able to have that conversation. They're still in the teachings and I don't know how many of my siblings are. I think some of them have kind of left the teachings, not all of them, but I'll let them speak for themselves on mm -hmm. that. An online group that was started while you were on TV. Free Ginger. Free Ginger. They got me into what snarking. What about? <laughs> yeah. The Free Ginger movement, right? I think they called themselves. Yeah. Crazy. So there was a whole forum called Free Ginger. And basically this group wanted me to be freed from my life. I think they would see me like roll my eyes on camera or mm. um, do things like that. But I was just being funny. Like I was just a very funny personality. I'm not like the other girls. Of funk, a lot of life. And so I would kind of lean into being that, that character. Um, okay. <laughs> and it was not acting, but it was like who I was. So I was like, whatever. Um, yeah. But they, they kind of, took this and ran with it and made a narrative of wanting me to run away from my family and move to the big city because they would see when we would travel to cities, I would always comment on how I loved the busyness. And I thought how cool it would be to live in New York City one day. And it's really funny. So they leaned heavily into that and made a thing of it. And I think they genuinely, looking back, like I'd say, okay, I think they saw some of the errors of this teaching and thought it was very... Um, oppressive and wanted me to come free. This is of kind that, of self-aware. Like leave Christianity altogether, mm. and so I I could see one side and say, oh, well, they were gracious enough to like think about me at that time. But my conclusion is different. So I all these years later, I'll look back at that and say, huh, that's interesting. But then my conclusion is totally different. I've come to freedom in Christ, mm -hmm. not freedom from throwing off all restraints and you know, living the good life, as they would say. Cool. Neat. Whatever. Suck my ass. <laughs> I'm in her book, but just wrapping it up with a few more questions. I know a lot of people who are familiar with your last name or your, uh, your former last name, Duggar, um, have heard your brother's name a lot because of his name just being in the news and just the sadness surrounding Don't say it, that. Kristen. And Please so don't say it. I was, when I read your book in chapter Begging 11, you, you mentioned him. Um, and just your compassion and your heart for him and your prayer for him. Um, for who, people who aren't familiar, I know it's your, he's the oldest Duggar. No, right? Josh. Don't go there. He was convicted of downloading and possessing. 
2021. Is that right? Thanks, Kristen. And so in chapter 11, you mention him and you kind of make a comparison between your brother Josh and Bill Gothard. Why did you feel like it was important to do that? They have one thing in common. You know, it's it's been such a difficult thing to, um, like, walk through that mm-hmm. season. Another thing, like I said, just being in the public eye and having to walk through time and time again so much pain um, publicly. And at the same time, I, I think I wanted to share a bit about this in the book because this is the whole, I think it goes back to the perspective on what is it to be pleasing to God. It's not putting up an outward front, acting like you're okay when inside your heart is not changed by the gospel. And like I said, that can't be done just by, by yourself. Because like that's what me, Josh needs. He needs the gospel. Or, or um, put on these outward things that's going to, your true heart is going to come out. And so I think, sadly, that's what happened with my brother and even with Bill Gothard. You can put on those, put up the front for so long, but then God will expose what is truly in your heart. And my prayer is for Bill Gothard and for my brother Josh that they would both come to save faith in Jesus Christ and that they would be broken um, over their sin. And that's something that um, we can only pray and ask the Lord to do. Yeah. Follow all of these rules and you will have abundance. You will have success. You will have health and wealth and all of yeah. these like prosperity gospel promises. And in fact, side story, I remember I was at an event once and I met Bill Gothard in person and you describe in your book how it's like this big moment if you meet him. And I remember feeling that way, like, oh, this yeah. is such a huge deal. I was in this line and we got to meet him. And he asked me, he said, so is your family, are they members of ATI, of the organization? We weren't. And so hilarious. The reason we weren't is because my parents originally had looked into joining. And one of the rules for men was that they could not have a beard, that they could not have any facial hair. And my dad has a beard. He always has. He did when he got married. He's never shaved it. And so they were (laughs) like, what? My parents were like, this is crazy. And so they're like, okay, well, we don't need to join. We can do some of the programs. So when Bill Gothard asked me that... (laughs) I literally told him, I was like, well, my parents are tell the into truth. joining, but my dad has a beard. And one of the rules says that men can't have beards. So we weren't able to join. And he kind of laughed. He was like, oh, oh, and then he said, well, tell your parents to look into joining again. We'll make sure that they get in or whatever. <laughs> and I was like, change that. How yeah, right. That, Kristen. Yes. yes. That's part of it though. Cause he's the authority. Yes. And so we get to make up those rules of like, Oh, you can't, you can not have a beard. And then that changes. He's like laughing, like you said, laughing at himself, like, huh, that's funny. Oh no, he can join. Try again, you know, and I'll change it. Yes. It's crazy. (laughs) What? Makes no sense. So I thought you would get a, get a kick out of that. And then when I got, my parents were like, oh, how'd it go? Like meeting him, I told them. And they were like, my dad was like, you told him that? And I was like, yes. Of course. And they were like, okay, whatever. But oh my goodness. So in other news, um, I don't know why, but the Duggars, let's see if I can zoom in, enhance. Oh, this one actually goes in pretty far. Sorry to these other people that you're in this picture, but um, yeah, the Duggars are on a trip with some of the family members to Israel. Um, and I don't know why they're there, but I'm sure they're going to do something offensive anyway. But I wanted to bring this up because this happened in the span of the last time I did a Duggar update. And, um, it's just really funny. So right now where I am in life, I'm just enjoying where God has me. You can hear um, their HVAC. Great wife, great little family. And their baby. And just enjoying business. I'm still active in politics as, and I, I do watch it a lot. I try to help out local candidates. What was the hardest? If watching politics is being active, then James is the fucking president. Okay, this one's probably mainly for you. What is the biggest misconception of your family? Oh, you're brainwashed. Um, your parents control you. Um, you're all going to have probably the same number of kids or have okay. a lot of kids. That's all the same. I'm definitely not Category. brainwashed. <laughs> I have a mind of my own. Hold on, what? Um, oh, why? I'm definitely not brainwashed. I have a mind of my own. So um, do I. <laughs> my dad even so Nobody asked. sometimes we'll have a argument, disagreements where we'll just talk things out and it's healthy. Like it's that's really good. Every family does. I'm not brainwashed. Just ask my dad. All right. So that's what I have for you today. I forget, but we are streaming 
um, March 17th, which is St. Patrick's Day. Um, and it's going to be really awesome and really special. And I hope you all are there. Um, and yeah, uh, I love you guys. And follow me on social media. Join the various memberships if you feel compelled to give me money. Um, remember to consensually smash that like and subscribe button. Drink lots of water. Be kind to each other. And... Try and get out and take a walk, maybe, if you can. Um, I will see you guys soon, and have a great weekend. Thank you, Michelle.